the, the possibility of uh, using anticoagulation on our patients. As uh, already published by the ERA-DTA registry regarding to the bleeding, uh, myocardial infarction and stroke in dialysis patient for more than uh, 200,000 patients in this registry, it was shown that uh, as a cause of death in dialysis patients, bleeding uh, will increase the mortality, also the myocardial infarction and stroke as uh, thrombotic events. And this was increased especially for patients with dialysis comparing to uh, general population. Uh, and as you see here, especially for bleeding, it was increased by 6.2 per 1,000 person years among dialysis patients, regarding to only 0 0.3 per 1,000 person year in general population. It is interesting that uh, when we are looking for the coagulation cascade and processes, I will not uh, uh, spend time on this, but uh, just look for the, this uh, intrinsic and extrinsic pathway uh, and using the activation of factor 10, and factor 10 is a key factor for this uh, cascade. The factor 10 will uh, uh, activate uh, prothrombin to thrombin 2A and then uh, activate fibrin to uh, make uh, cl uh, fibrin clot uh, and uh, thrombosis. It is interesting also to know that the nearest acquired uh, hemostatic abnormalities have been also uh, identified in uh, renal insufficiency, especially regarding to the alteration in platelet function. Secondly, to the alteration of platelet vessel uh, wall uh, interaction, and finally, to the in enhancing role of uh, 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 bleeding by uh, the intensity of the anemia in uh, CKD patients. Also, we have uh, some therapy that uh, uh, contribute to the increase the risk of uh, bleeding in uh, CKD patients. Not only this, but also uh, CKD patients are also uh, subject to clot formation and increase of development of uh, thrombosis as we know that pulmonary embolism is more frequent in dialysis patients. Vascular access uh, thrombosis also is uh, much more important, especially also when we have a PTF graft, graft more than a native arteriovenous fistula. And we know that uh, there is a high prevalence of uh, systemic, and this is due, uh, sorry, to the high prevalence of systemic inflammation in CKD patients, but also diffuse on the thelia damage, activation of platelet and monocytes, reduced antithrombin level activity, deficiency in uh, anticoagulant protein C and S, and also alteration of uh, the activated uh, protein C with the resistance to, to, uh, to it. And it is interesting to note that these abnormalities are also reversible, and as it was uh, published in this paper, uh, six, for 16 patients with hypercoagulable uh, states on hemodialysis therapy, and who underwent uh, uh, renal transplantation, author shows, uh, sh share uh, with us that uh, um, deficiencies in protein C, S, antithrombin 3, and uh, resistant to protein C were uh, completely corrected by uh, kidney transplantation and normalization of uh, uh, renal function. So these are reversible. But the problem also for our patient is not only uh, this problem uh, find, uh, found in uh, CKD patients, but patients on hemodialysis also uh, are subject to activation of the coagulation cascade, especially due to the plasmatic coagulation activation, the cellular co uh, coagulation activation, especially by the platelet uh, activation, but also leukocytes and platelet uh, uh, coagulation and uh, uh, tissue factors, so uh, stimulation, and finally by uh, other factors such as uh, the slow blood flow, the high hematocrit, but also the blood transfusion in the extra uh, corporeal circuit. And I uh, usually I, I, uh, emphasize especially the problem of uh, the use of dialyzer and the contact uh, by the blood to the membrane, but also the arterial and venous bubble traps, which are two uh, parts of the extra corporeal circuit where the clotting is very easily uh, formated or initiated. To, uh, to control this uh, clot formation in hemodialysis, we uh, 
use uh, anticoagulation and we can classify the anticoagulation in dependent on uh, their chemical composition or their inhibition of the clotting cascade and directly or directly or also by the target within the clotting cascade which is uh, the more used and uh, we have the uh, the indirect agent, agents increasing the activity of the natural inhibitors such as heparin and heparinoids and the direct thrombin inhibitors that block thrombin and finally uh, the citrate that can act also as an anticoagulation uh, in our patients. This is an overview of all uh, the anticoagulants we can use in our patients. We have, uh, of course, a fractionated heparin and uh, low molecular heparin, but also the direct thrombin inhibitor, the heparinoid, the citrate, and uh, other, especially the prostacycline that we can use also when they, we have a problem with the uh, heparins. You can have this uh, slides, of course. Uh, it's up to you if you have, like to have the slides uh, after the, the um, after the session. Which is interesting to, to note now, which is important and which is better for you to use infractionated heparin or low molecular weight. This is the big debate in the literature. I don't know if you use infractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin. Who uses infractionated uh, heparin? who use uh, so uh, low molecular weight heparin? Most of you. Because you think that low molecular heparin is more efficient? Or it is less expensive? It is less expensive low molecular heparin than heparin. Yeah. Yeah. It is not on the, all the countries. For example, in Tunisia, where I come from, heparin is much more, 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 uh, much less, less, less expensive than uh, low molecular weight heparin. So we choose to use heparin, for example, and fractionated heparin. The problem is uh, the debate still open because unfractionated heparin especially uh, inhibit the thrombin and the factor 10. Otherwise, the low molecular weight heparin predominantly inhibits uh, factor 10. Otherwise, it's not specific. And uh, the problem of uh, uh, long molecular weight uh, heparin is that uh, longer half-life more than four hours for most, most of the, all the low molecular heparin. Otherwise, the short half-life of uh, unfractionated heparin is very interesting to note in this, uh, in this field. What is also interesting to note is that uh, the low molecular heparin, we use it because uh, maybe it, uh, it has the best bio uh, availability at low doses, less non-specific binding to endothelium, macrophages, platelet, plasma protein, and so on. The dose is independent. Uh, we have a dose-independent clearance. The longer life, uh, half-life for, uh, for use in hemodialysis patient is not a good thing, I think. The more predictable anticoagulant response, the single fillet syringe injection, and this is the, the, uh, the choice of the low molecular heparin we, we, uh, we, we, we take. Also, there is no monitoring required for routine healthy, of course, outpatients. So when we look for the debate and we ask uh, some monitors in this domain, as uh, Andrew Davenport, he said that unfractionated heparin is the anticoagulant of choice, and uh, this is for many years. Otherwise, the trend is, attri uh, is uh, attributable to the ease of uh, convenience and the administration of low molecular heparin make the more low molecular heparin mostly used nowadays. What about guidelines? And the guidelines we have of, from uh, European society is from 2002. And uh, it said that the advantage as mentioned in guidelines that uh, um, major study shows in the improvement of lipid profile with low molecular weight heparin, and uh, especially for reducing uh, uh, or less increase in uh, reducing, sorry, the dense LDL, I mean LDL 5 and 6, and that's have an anti uh, atherogenic effect. Also, the low molecular heparin increased less uh, hyper uh, potassium uh, comparing to unfractionated heparin related to the aldosterone inhibition with the uh, unfractionated heparin, which is dose dependent also. And low molecular heparin reduced aldosterone up to 30% less than unfractionated heparin. And also, 
uh, the, the osteoporosis also as mentioned, and uh, maybe uh, the unfractionated, uh, the low molecular weight heparin have many advantages regarding to the heparin. But also for the heparin induced uh, thrombocytopenia, the heat, we have to think of, of course, for our patients, but uh, there is an advantage for, and it is believed that low molecular heparin is uh, less likely to form such a, uh, reaction because the complex with, uh, with the sh long chain of uh, saccharides is minimal with uh, low molecular heparin than it is with unfractionated heparin. Please look here that for the fundaparinix, for example, for example, there is uh, no possibility to have the interaction, so it is safely used in uh, HIT. What about the studies now? And this is, uh, I will show you two reviews regarding to the comparison between uh, low molecular weight heparin and unfractionated heparin. Regarding to the bleeding, there is no difference in this meta-analysis, but the advantage is especially regarding to the transfusion requirement, which is less with low molecular heparin regarding to the uh, heparin, unfractionated heparin use. Also, if you look for the vascular compression time, it is the same. If you look for the extracorporeal thrombosis, it is the same. So there is no difference out of uh, uh, blood transfusion for in this, uh, this meta-analysis. This is another uh, uh, systemic review and meta-analysis, recently, more recently published. And uh, they uh, find the same results regarding to bleeding, no difference in the bleeding, so there is no difference for bleeding between unfractionated heparin and low molecular heparin. Otherwise, there is uh, some advantage for lipid profile for total cholesterol and triglycerides, but not for LDL cholesterol, and maybe, as I showed you before, improving the quality of the LDL cholesterol, reducing the low and dense uh, LDL cholesterol, uh, five and six, uh, w which are very uh, atherogenous for our patients. For the osteoporosis, there is no uh, study evaluated the incidence of osteoporotic fractures uh, said in this meta-analysis. Otherwise, two studies me measure the osteoporotigerin, uh, uh, oste oste osteoprotegerin, sorry, and the rankle level, and there is no significant difference between uh, low molecular weight heparin and unfractionated heparin. And one study evaluated the uh, bone marrow density uh, and uh, bone mineral density, sorry, and uh, uh, there is uh, no difference also in, the, in this study, and uh, uh, there is uh, some uh, dec decreased switch into uh, a low molecular weight heparin and uh, the mean bone, man, bone mineral density in the same region decreased by 238% after the patient were back to the unfractionated heparin. So there is some advantage for low molecular heparin, but it is not uh, significant. Otherwise, for the thrombocytopenia, uh, one study reported no uh, thrombocytopenia in this meta-analysis, and for the other, no, nothing was uh, 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 announced regarding to the thrombocytopenia. For the hyperkalemia, it was not uh, studied in this meta-analysis, so the conclusion of the authors that low molecular weight heparin showed to be at least as safe as unfractionated heparin for extra circuit uh, um, anticoagulation in chronic hemodialysis, and there is no difference uh, uh, noted in this meta-analysis too. What about the Cochrane meta-analysis? And the Cochrane meta-analysis was announced in 2015, but no results up to now. No publication, only this abstract in the LADT uh, 2018, I think. And, uh, in, uh, uh, and in, this, uh, in their conclusion, the evidence for anticoagulation drugs hemodialysis uh, during hemodialysis is of very low certainty and as, uh, as trial have uh, not been designated to measure important clinical outcomes. So uh, there is two other considerations when using low molecular uh, weight heparins. The first is regarding to the half-life and the selectivity. Of course, for example, enoxaparin is more selective for uh, factor 10A than uh, tanzaparin, for example. But when you look for the half-life, the half-life of uh, enoxaparin is 24 hours, regarding to the tanzaparin, five hours. And for hemodialysis, we don't need such a long, li uh, uh, 
half-life, so it is more interesting to use tanzaparine, for example, than enoxaparine in our, uh, for our patients. The second one is the, the venous and the administration and the arterial administration, and we are, have to look for especially arterial administration, since if we do it on the venous, uh, with, uh, in the venous line, we have an increase in anti uh, ten activities, so we have usually to use it at the same site injection, which is art uh, artery. What about uh, the guidelines uh, for uh, the, the, the recent guidelines for the UK uh, Renal Association? And in their guidelines, they uh, announced that uh, anticoagulation without added risk of bleeding, we should use even unfractionated heparin or low molecular heparin to reduce the risk of clotting. Heparin, we can use it as a, load, a loading dose followed by continuous infusion and uh, it is thus continued 30 minutes before the end of dialysis and low molecular weight heparin is an alternative. So they privilege heparin, a fractionated heparin. So it is an alternative agent that has been associated with a lower risk of bleeding, less frequent episodes of hyperkalemia and improved lipid profile compared to standard heparin. Otherwise, when we look for the meta-analysis, we don't seem to understand that in their results. Otherwise, there is, no different, uh, uh, there is no difference in the incidence of bleeding complication, it was said in these uh, uh, guidelines. Also, for patients with significant risk of bleeding, we should use uh, uh, systematic, systemic uh, anticoagulation, uh, keeping a minimum, uh, keep to a minimum dose. Otherwise, we should avoid uh, anticoagulation if the risk of uh, bleeding is uh, life training. And uh, unfractionated heparin may be used with caution in patients with intermediate risk of bleeding, but at low dose. The proposition also to use uh, regional citrate on anticoagulation for this patient, and I think this is a, a, nice, uh, an, a nice possibility uh, in our patient with uh, a risk of bleeding, since it is a uh, regional anticoagulation only. For uh, the anticoagulation in patients with HIT, type 2 and HITs, and uh, now in this, uh, in this um, case, we don't have to use heparin, and we, we can use the heparin with, especially for the danaparoid, for example. We can use it in, uh, uh, for our patient, otherwise it, it is very expensive, and I think in Africa we don't have it. I'm, I'm not, I don't know if you have it or not, of course, in Tunisia we don't have it, so we have to use only uh, dialysis without heparin with flushing, uh, saline flushing, and uh, we use also uh, sometimes the citrate anticoagulation as a regional anticoagulation. So if you have, why not, direct thrombin inhibitors or heparin weight, and if, if you don't have it, you can use citrate anti, uh, uh, anti, uh, regional citrate anticoagulation. We use it, but we use it at that time because this is a, um, an old study. We use acetate dialysate, not bicarbonate, because the problem using citrate is uh, the alkalosis and hypocalcemia. And as you see, when you use uh, uh, <coughs> acetate as a dialysate, we don't have, uh, we, 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 it is very effective, as you see here, it is very effective for uh, the regional anticoagulation but also we don't have an increase in uh, serum bicarbonate, otherwise we start a little bit uh, low, and we don't have problem of hypocalcemia in our patients. So it is safely used using uh, acetate, but now we don't have acetate, and we have bicarbonate, and we have infused bicarbonate also, it is possible, but the risk is uh, especially hypocalcemia, hypomagnesemia, but also citrate toxicity, especially for uh, patients with uh, hepatic failure and uh, the problem of metabolic uh, alkalosis in, for uh, these patients. We can use uh, uh, citrate as a maintaining dose without loading dose, and the monitoring is, uh, uh, we use uh, the post dialyzer ionized calcium, 0.2 through 0.3 millimole per liter, uh, of course, to, uh, uh, to uh, inhibit the citrate activity. And it is well used without any problem, and it's very, um, it is not expensive, and uh, we can use it without any problem. The, uh, the, uh, um, lastly, 
we have uh, the use of citrate dialysates since we can replace uh, citra uh, acetate by uh, citrate in uh, the dialysate using 0 0.8 millimole of citrate and there is uh, no additional calcium uh, needed uh, by, uh, by reducing the alzheimer membrane fooling it has been reported to improve the alzheimer clearance also and uh, however the serum magnesium uh, values might decline if uh, the dialysate with a low level of magnesium is uh, utilized so usually we think about uh, uh, f uh, checking the magnesium and the correct hypomagnesium in uh, these patients the reports of citrate dialysate permitting anticoagulation uh, 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 anticoagulant free hemodialysis is uh, published and it is true use it in the center where i work now and we can have uh, dialysis without use of anticoagulant when we use uh, citrate dialysate otherwise additional but uh, reduced dose of anticoagulant are frequently used for uh, these patients what about if patients have already uh, anticoagulation or anticoagulation? What we, have to, what we have to do? The conclusion of this study comparing no additional anticoagulation versus low dose of uh, deltaparine with patients with uh, antivitamin K and they show that there is a benefit for using uh, to avoid clotting uh, heparin. And the conclusion of this study is uh, that uh, they are able to demonstrate that standard oral anticoagulation with an ENR between two and three alone will not prevent clotting during dialysis. So we have to use anticoagulation uh, with heparin for these patients, but we don't know if the ENR is between three and 3.5, if we have to use or not uh, such, uh, such uh, uh, anticoagulation for the extracorporeal circuit. Most of our patients can have atrial fibrillation and for that, do you think that uh, using antivitamin K is very uh, useful, uh, is useful and uh, can, give, uh, uh, can protect patients from uh, uh, stroke? This is a meta-analysis showing that there is only one, one study which is positive. There are many studies without benefit and one study with harm, or two study with harm, especially for elderly patients. So I don't think that antivitamin K is, uh, is uh, interesting in our patients. I'm, I'm not a cardiologist, but cardiologists usually ask us to use antivitamin K. Otherwise, we'd have to remember that antivitamin K have many problems, more than pro the problem of bleeding. The first cause of mortality in our dialysis center is bleeding due to especially uh, antivitamin K. And the arterial calcification also is induced by the vitamin K antagonist, arterial stiffness also, left ventricular hypertrophy, and especially calciphylaxis. I saw in the two last year, three calciphylaxis, and the three are on uh, antivitamin K. What about the new oral anticoagulant? When you look for dialysis, not to use, not to use, not to use, not to use. So we, have, we can't use this uh, medication in our patients. Otherwise, in the USA, it is possible to use apicapsaban. And when we look for the apicapsaban and we look for the US renal data system, and uh, we look for the, uh, the major bleeding, we see that with the uh, uh, direct uh, oral anticoagulation and comparing to heparin, there is a benefit, a benefit for uh, uh, this direct oral anticoagulation means uh, uh, apicapsidum. And finally, do you think that the use of aspirin as an antiplatelet uh, uh, for our patients can prevent from ischemic stroke this uh, study and this meta-analysis also show us that it's very beneficial to prevent especially myocardial infarction uh, and uh, so uh, this is for stroke and uh, to prevent stroke otherwise uh, myocardial infarction stroke and cardiovascular death sorry and the reduction is about uh, uh, 40 percent otherwise this is balanced by the risk of uh, bleeding and if you apply this result to sharp trial, uh, 
treating uh, 1,000 dialysis patients with vascular disease with aspirin for five years. This is projected to prevent six, uh, 16 ischemic strokes, 75 myocardial infarction or revascularization. Otherwise, it had 19 intracranial bleeds and 53 serious extracranial extra bleeds. So uh, to conclude, uh, dear colleagues, and the take home messages is that uh, the CKD 5D is a population at high risk of bleeding and thrombosis, and this is multifactorial. The anticoagulation is needed to avoid clotting of the alizer and extracorporeal circuit, especially for bleeding, a fractionated heparin equal to low molecular heparin, lipid profile, maybe there is a benefit for low molecular weight heparin. At, uh, we don't know for the consequences for the major atherovascular uh, events. For the heat, it, maybe there is some benefit for unfractionated heparin. Sorry, it must be the, the inverse. Otherwise, if we have heat, we have not to use unfractionated nor low molecular heparin. For the osteoporosis, maybe there is some benefit, especially, uh, sorry also for the mistake, there is some benefit for the low molecular heparin, but no supporting clinical data. And for hyperkalemia also, there is some benefit for low molecular heparin, but no supporting data too. Maybe for the cost, this is a, a possible uh, point of choice for between the two, and the simplicity, which is usually for, uh, in favor of low molecular weight heparin. If we have heat, we use the, uh, the, the naparoid especially, but the cost is very important. The alternative is use of regional citrate anticoagulation. For the hemodialysis, free anticoagulation is possible with citrate dialysate, but we have to use a high blood flow rate and maybe we can use the saline regular flushing of the extracorporeal circuit if we can't use a, a citrate dialysate. Otherwise, if uh, warfarin was used, it still needs the use of heparin at a lower dose, maybe 50% uh, of the dose. For the CKD 5D, 5 hemodialysis um, atrial fibrillation patient, the use of antivitamin K is less efficacy than in uh, non-hemodialysis patients. Maybe we have to look for the treatment to range, that it should be more than 70%. And also we can look for the side effect of uh, these molecules, arterial calcification, stiffness calcification also, calciphylaxis. The direct oral anticoagulation is not to use in, uh, in our patients, only in the USA, which is possible to use. And uh, with the retrospective core data, there is less major bleeding, so it is a hope for our patients. And finally, for the CKD5HD five, uh, five atherometrous patients, antiplatelet therapy should be used because we have a prevention of stroke, uh, myocardial infarction, and cardiovascular death. Otherwise, it is balanced by the increase of major bleeding. Thank you for your attention.